Shall we go before the Lord in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We're especially blessed sharing and revealing your word, Father, to human beings. The greatest blessing that man has ever received. For without the word, we'd not know Jesus. Without the word, we'd not know you, Father. Without the word, we'd not know the Holy Spirit. Without the word, we'd not know healing. Without the word, we'd not know deliverance. Without the word, we'd not know. We'd be ignorant of spiritual things. And to be ignorant of spiritual things would be to be filled with death. So your word is life unto us as we find it. And we ask you, sir, in the name of Jesus to rise and live big within us today that we may find the word of God and walk in its light and be filled with its love and its glorious power. Hallelujah. And that not one single person leave here today untouched by the power of the living almighty God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we leave the throne of grace, in one of the other services that I was privileged to conduct, we set ourselves in agreement together for the deliverance of our people in Iran. So we're not going to pray again about it. No use in praying again about it. We've already prayed. The Bible said we pray anything according to His will. We know He heareth us. We know when He hears us, we have the petitions that we desired of Him. So all we're going to do is just praise Him for it. And those of you that were not here in that service, this will be an excellent opportunity for you to join yourself in agreement with us in the name of Jesus. And then don't talk about I'm not coming home anymore. So let's just lift our hands and praise the Lord who knows how to deliver them. It's in good hands. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We praise you that the people in Iran are free. We glorify your name in it. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord God forevermore. Hallelujah. All right. And all in one agreement, if you agree with that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll briefly reiterate some things that we've already discussed and then we will continue discussing the fact that love is life and it is life in the absolute sense. <clears throat> Today, as the Spirit of God leads and reveals, we're going to look at three different aspects of God. And I believe you'll be greatly blessed. But now I'm going to tell you right now, let's make a decision to pay very careful attention to the Word of God. In a place this size, normally always have some kind of movement. And if you don't make a firm quality decision right now to, to be undistracted, then movement can catch your eye and you'll find yourself watching somebody and that somebody's not going to do a thing in the world for you. They're just going out to drink of water. The drink of water that I'm offering you is a well spring of life. But now you have to make a decision right now to listen to it because it's not going to fit your religion at all. I can just tell you that right now. Religion and the Bible don't mix well. Because <laughs> there's scriptures in the Bible that will absolutely foul your religion up something awful. <laughs> so we need to get ourselves in a position where we read the Word of God and listen to the Spirit of God instead of reading the Bible in the light of what so-and-so said the Bible said that we thought their uncle said that his brother because he went to the seminary said that the Word of God said. <laughs> Amen. Oh, you might as well try and be read it off, reading it off the back of a bus. It's not fair. Now, 
Father, we set ourselves to hear the Spirit of God. We set our attention on the Word of God in Jesus' name. Now, the reason I said that to you is because when you begin to talk about God himself, and you begin to talk about himself from himself, then you have opportunities to be distracted. And when you're talking about God, you're talking about somebody that does not fit into our natural patterns. We should have long ago figured into his patterns. But if you're walking in the natural, you're not knowing much about God. When you're discussing God himself, <laughs> we need all the help we can get. Praise the Lord. We've got ample help through God the Spirit. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. God is speaking in the scripture, and he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, <clears throat> that thou mayest obey his voice, <clears throat> excuse me, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. Would you read that aloud with me, please? For he is thy life, and the length of thy days. Read that aloud for me. And the length of thy days. Now notice that this scripture said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. In other words, you don't have any excuse. Heaven has it recorded, and so does the earth. And all the natural laws of the earth have been commanded by God to yield to your decision. Now, I want you to get that. Because the understood subject of the sentence here is the word you. Y-O-U. I have placed before you life and death, therefore choose. Therefore, you choose. You make the choice. Heaven has been alerted to the fact you have the right to make the choice between life and death. And earth has been alerted to the fact that you have the right to make the choice of life and death. And Satan himself can't do anything to stop it when you make the choice. Because he's already been told by God and already been alerted that when you choose, he can't stop it. He has to deal with God in this. You think about it a second. When you made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, all the demons in hell put together couldn't stop the new birth from taking place. All that turkey could do is come along and tell you you didn't get anything. Well, you know, I mean, you don't feel like you think you should. Maybe you don't look like a why. You don't think blah, 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 blah. That's all he could do. If he had all the power that he's been lying to you and to me, telling us he has, he would not be required to be a deceiver. He'd just kill you and have it done with. He can't do that. Heaven has already been alerted that you and I have the right of choice. We're in God's class. We weren't created in angelic class. We were created in God's class. We have a right to make a choice. Satan didn't have any right to make a choice. And it bit him forever when he took upon himself the positionship of a God. He doesn't have that right. You do. Jesus paid for that right with his blood. Hallelujah. All right, now let's go to 1 John. Not the Gospel of John. Little John. <laughs> Little John chapter 1. Verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands, have handled the word of life. Now, there's three different words in this study that we're going to be looking for everywhere they come up. Life, light, and love. Life, light, and love. By the help of the Spirit of God, we're going to see these three subjects intermingle themselves in the Word of God. 
if you will listen carefully to what the scripture is saying, I hope you brought your Bible in this service today. Because we're going to read a lot of scripture. If you didn't, take a pencil and paper and make note of it. Because you need to study out these scriptures. And if you will study them carefully and take careful note of what I'm saying to you today, buy the tape of the service and listen to it over and over and over and over again. Because if you will listen to what the Spirit of God is going to show you today, there is not any darkness, there is not any force of hell, not any, not one, that will be able to overcome you between now and the time that Jesus comes. You can walk victoriously in all the realms of life. Say, well, maybe God doesn't want me to walk victoriously in all the realms of life. Well, then he ought not let you come here. He ought not let you be born into the earth. He shouldn't have let you choose Jesus as your Lord because Jesus said, I'm the life and the way. Hallelujah. I'm the truth. He said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but don't be afraid of it. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. Oh, he ought not let us know that if he wouldn't want to have more than victory. Listen, victory is what was God's mind in the first place. That's been on his mind all the time. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. For the life was manifested. Now, let's read it like this. The life was manifested, and we've seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. I want to make mention again here of the fact that the life, he's, of the life that he's talking about is absolute life. The definition of the word zoe, simplest definition of it, is life in the absolute sense. Now God is absolute. God is absolute life. God is absolute light. God is absolute love. Absolute life has no death at all in it. Absolute light has no darkness at all in it. And absolute love has no hate at all in it. Now, did you get hold of that? All right, now notice this. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. Read that. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Now, absolute darkness, I mean absolute light, in that light is no darkness. Now let me make a, let me make a statement to you that is so simple. It is so simple and take you years to understand it. <laughs> is alive and death is dead life is alive and death is dead as long as the life is active death has no part of it I'm talking about absolute life in God see the darkness can never overcome the light light always overcomes darkness Death can never overcome life. Death never overcomes life. Life always has overcome death. The only way death ever comes in is when life leaves. See, the life is alive. The death is dead. It has no life. It would have to have life to overcome anything. It doesn't have any life of its own. It follows life. When light is removed, darkness comes in. Darkness never comes in and drives out the light. The light has to be removed for the darkness to come in. Now, can you project your thinking into that? Life is alive and death is dead. 
Now, this is true where God and Satan are concerned. The only way Satan ever got in in the first place was to come on his way in here, and Adam accepted it. He allowed the life to leave, and when it went through sin, the darkness came in. Well, then it had to be driven back out. God is life. In him is our life. Our life is hid in God. The life we live, we live through him. Are you listening to those scriptures that I'm quoting to you about life? What happens when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? The Bible said you were crucified with Christ. What did that? You made the decision to make Jesus Lord, but the Bible says that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. What happens when a seed is planted? This whole planet operates on the, on the principle and the seed plant harvest law. It is a law. You can't even choose to live without it. You're going to live with it one way or the other. And if you wake up and begin to plant the word of God and reap and sow to the spirit, you'll reap life. If you don't, you're going to reap death because there's not any other thing except life and death. That's all there is to it. It all operates on the same law. The law of Genesis. The law of beginnings. That everything produces after its own kind. And that is the seed plant harvest law. Thank God for giving old Roberts a revelation of that. I've heard people say, do you suppose that's all he's going to preach on anymore? Blah, 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 blah. Well, that's all he ought to preach on until we get it. <laughs> no use preaching on anything else till we get it. Jesus is talking about it in the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. He said, this parable is the granddaddy of all of them. Now, that's the Copeland translation. It's a little loose, but you, you understand what he's saying. He said, if you can understand this parable, you can have all others. Then he taught the parable of the sower and the seed. All right. When you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, the Bible teaches us that you received zoe. You received what the English translation calls eternal life, calls everlasting life. It's very difficult to put into English words zoe because it's the life of God. It's the thing that makes God God. It's the thing that makes God a cut above everything else. Because in him is no darkness, brother. I mean, in him is no death. Absolute, ultimate life. When God's on the scene, nothing dies but death. Did you get that? Now, well, that's the first time I ever heard it, too. <laughs> Thank you, the Lord. Oh, glory to God. But the Bible, the Bible trying, to, trying to, to get over to us the nature and the quality of Zoe has called it everlasting life or eternal life. In other words, man, it's forever. It, eternal life, you can't stop it from living. It's just from now on. And when you get to the end of that, there's another eternity out in front of that. It's forever. That's its quality. In that quality, it has great power. Great power to overcome and when the Spirit of God, when you planted the seed of God's Word, that Word has Zoe in it. This is the Word of life. Say it, the Word of life. You planted that Word in your spirit. Now you didn't plant it in your mind. It came through the animal of your mind, came through the avenue of your mind. But it didn't cause your mind to be reborn. It didn't cause your body to be reborn. It caused your spirit being to be reborn. Proverbs chapter 4 says to protect your spirit, for out of it flow the forces of life. That's where the life force comes from, is in the spirit realm. All life has come from the spirit realm. God is a spirit, and he has the, the, and is the creator of all life. All life, no life exists except God is at the center of it. He started all things that are alive. Now, when you made that action, what did you do? You believed in your heart that God had raised Jesus 
to life. You were taking the word of life to extract from it the life that you needed. Then with your mouth you said something. Now this now you might as well just make a note of this right now. The seeding plant harvest principle about which this planet and this universe functions also functions and primarily operates through the mouth on the God level. Angels don't have the right to choose their own words. They speak thus saith the Lord. Human beings have the right to choose their own words. And when you choose God's words, you choose life. For they are life to those that find or those that choose them. And health to all their flesh. Proverbs 4, 20, 21, 22, 23. All those scriptures there discussing this very same subject. When you did that, you believed it in your heart. In other words, you allowed the seed to get in your heart. You dropped the screen of resistance and allowed that word to transcend from your intellect down into your spirit being. And when that seed got down in there, it germinated through your belief, through your acceptance of it, and said, yes, I make that decision. But then with your mouth, confession was made unto salvation, unto deliverance, unto the releasing of that life. You said it with your mouth. You put words to your decision, and you said, thank you, God, I'm saved. And life sprang out of the words of God that was in your spirit and drove out spiritual death. And you became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now you want me to tell you what the problem from that point on is? Your mind is not renewed to the word. Now you got your spirit going one way and your mind trying to go another. And your body probably trying, probably trying to go a third way. You're trying to determine what all the feelings are. Trying to determine, oh, what is this I feel? What is this I see? This doesn't look like God. How would you know? Did you ever stop and think about the services we get into and say, oh, do we feel God now? Let's find out if God's here. Do we feel him? I don't feel God. Oh, I feel God. How can he be over there and not over here? Why will that not work? Why do we have to take God's word for it? God is a spirit. God is light. God is love. God is life. Now I said something to you a couple of days ago. I want to reiterate it right here so you can see through a little something here. This universe that you and I are a part of has in it the intellectual realm and it has in it the physical realm, but it is controlled by the spiritual realm. Now, this universe that we're operating in in the natural realm is limited by the speed of light. God said, light be. He could have said, dirt be, trees be. Bodies be. <laughs> he didn't. He started at the most perfect element. The element of all energy in the natural realm, science has very finally figured out, is light. Einstein stumbled on to one of the laws of God in light. You can tell from that exactly how God wrote the Ten Commandments in those, in those tablets of stone. The Bible said he did it with his finger. Well, Habakkuk 3, 5 tells us how he did it with his finger. It said his light filled a place full of his brightness. And out of his hands, out of his hands, one translation said came lightnings. Another translation said come shafts of light. Well, what is amplified light? Light amplified, S S E R radiated. What's that spell? 
laser. A laser beam is amplified light. No trouble for God to light in a rock. He is light. This whole planet functions on that level. Anything that operates above the speed of light, you can't see it with your natural eye. This is what has confounded Christians for years. Because God operates in a level you can't see with the natural eye. But, it, but when you begin to operate over in that level, you can change what you see with the natural eye. This whole natural realm is subject to the force that created it. And the Bible says that that force took on the form of faith. F-A-I-T-H. That's the name of it. It's the name of that, that element that God used to create with. It's part of it. Now, everything, everything in the natural realm has got movement in it. All the molecules of that leaf are moving. All the molecules of this have movement. Everything you can see has got movement. If you could speed that movement up to above 186,000 miles a second, you couldn't see that speaker anymore. It looked like it ceased to exist. It didn't cease to exist, but you know you couldn't feel it. But you're feeling it back down there, it'd be. Now that is the highest we ever go on this planet. We reach up to the speed of light. That's what God set in motion when he said, let there be light. That's where heaven starts, where we stop. And here we have the idea that the only thing real is what we can see. <laughs> and it is such a low manifestation of the real thing that it isn't even funny. Spiritual things are more real than natural things. The Word of God's more real than your physical body. I had one man tell me one time, he said, you know, he said, I just, uh, he said, I was confessing that I was healed, but he said, I finally got sick, I had to say I was sick. He didn't realize, he didn't realize that what he was saying is more real than the sickness and disease. Had he been saying it out of his spirit, now if he's saying it out of his mind, it didn't. Because not any power in your mind except a little willpower, and that won't heal and it won't create. Are you listening to me now? Jesus said, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Word of God is full of glorious light. The glorious light of this gospel hath shined unto them. So you take the Word full of life, full of light, full of love, and feed it into your spirit and feed on it 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 and that's real consecration. That is real committal to God. Where you are not willing to feed on the other things. Jesus said you take heed what you hear for the way you hear it's the way it's going to be measured back to you. What you put in there is what's going to come out. You don't put anything in there nothing's going to come out. I don't care how much you love God. No word, no power. That's just the way it is. I don't care how much you love Henry Ford. No gas, no go. That's the power source to the Ford automobile. I don't care if your name is Henry Ford. No gas, no go. Isn't that right? Why? Because that's the way the thing's made. And I don't care whether you like it or whether you don't. I don't care whether you like this kind of preaching or whether you don't. has no change on it whatsoever. has no bearing on it. It does not have anything to do with it because that's the way things are. I have people write me and say, well, here is the strange doctrine that you're preaching. I'm not preaching any doctrine. I'm telling you principles of God. It has nothing to do with doctrine. Alright, let's go on here for a moment. Verse 
verse 5, this then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. When does the blood cleanse you? When you walk in the light. Somebody said, how do you do that? <laughs> Can you think of a scripture that would give you a clue? The entrance of his word bring of light. You might have to walk in the word. You're going to have to walk in the word that God reveals to you. I know people, I've met people in schools around the country. I know people that know a lot more Bible than I do and don't know a fathom thing that God ever said. You know, I know fellas, you can ask them, what verse is this or what verse is that? And they just start in it like a parrot. I've got a computer in Fort Worth that knows more Bible than I do. But that thing won't get healed by it. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Just know the words is not going to do it. You have to walk in the light of the words. Now let me show you what I'm talking about here. It's very simple. Let's talk for a moment about Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Jesus said, have the faith of God. All right, to walk in the light of that scripture, then we're going to have to walk in the light of what he's about to say. Because it's God's faith. It's not Baptist faith, not Methodist faith, it's not Pentecostal faith, it's not Assembly of God faith, it's not Catholic faith, it's God's faith. So I'm really not too interested in what the Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Catholic. I'm not interested in what NBC says about it. I don't care what ABC says about it. I don't care what CBS says about it. I really don't care what you say about it. And I could care less what I think about it. It's God's faith. We ought to find out what he says about it. Isn't that right? All right, that's what it means to walk in the light of Mark 11, 22. But then Jesus went ahead to say... Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now how are we going to walk in the light of that? You can't walk in the light of that and go to writing Brother Hagin letters and go to writing me letters and go to writing Charles Trapp's letters and all Robert and Jerry Seville and everybody else you can think of that ever mentioned anything about this. You can't go to writing us letters and say, well, I don't believe in that saying stuff. You don't. No. I don't believe in talking to things. You said one time in one of your meetings to talk to my body. No, I didn't say that. Yeah, you said that. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did, Brother Copeland. I heard you say that. No, Jesus said that, Mark 11, 23. Whosoever shall speak to the mountain. All I'm doing is walking in the light of it. I never had an original thought in my life. I'm not hunting one. I'm hunting God's thoughts. Oh, Lord, as I have here of the devil. You're not smart enough to originate one. You either get them off alive or dead. They're either selfish or they're in love. There's only two ways to go. It's not God's way, the devil's way, and your way. Who do you think you are? don't believe in that saying stuff. Yes, you do. You do it all the time. It's one of the laws or genesis of this planet. If you've got a mouth, you've been doing it. Not me. Oh, yeah. I heard you say I ought to talk nice to my car. I don't talk to
to my car. I'm educated. No, you're not. Oh, yes. I'm educated. No, you're not. Somebody comes along and says, that man's education is keeping him away from God. No, it's a lack of it. If you don't know, God is not an educated man. So, take a look at this. Here is a law that says, Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he says, those are words, and he shall have whatsoever he said. Not 10% of it, all of it. But now Jesus also proved something to us. He said, by your words you're justified, and by your words you're condemned. That law works on the negative side just as soon as it does on the affirmative side. And wherever you're spending your time, that's the way you're going to work it. Because you are a spirit being, you live in a planet governed by spiritual law, and you're going to operate in it either on the right or the wrong. You can't stay in there static. If you ever become static, you'll have to leave this planet. Or be jailed in the center of it, one. And you see, the same guy... He says, I don't believe in that saying stuff. Just watch him. You won't have to watch him 30 minutes. I have a friend of mine who's a carpenter. <laughs> I watch people all the time. This friend of mine in Fort Worth, he, and he's a good, good man, good carpenter, been, been building for years. And, and I was watching him one day. We, we were working on a little old thing out there at my house. And he had hit this nail twice and dropped it. He picked that nail up. Now, he wasn't standing there trying to be spiritual, man. He's trying to drive a nail in a board inside the closet. And he said, Now, nail, I'm telling you for sure, this time you're going in the wall. <laughs> well, I think you talk to things. Not me. What do you think Jesus was doing in that boat? He said to the wind, to it. He didn't talk to God about it. He said to it. See, there's no use in you talking to God about anything if you're not going to walk in the light of what he's already said. If you go to God and say, what about the mountain? He's going to say, what about the talking? You go talk to it and then come talk to me. I've already told you about the talking to it. Now don't talk to me till you talk to it. And so I waited for over an hour, and I said, Joe, how come you talked that nail a while ago? Now, this is a man of faith. But I just want to show you how, how unconsciously you walk in spiritual law all day long. I said, how come you talked that nail? He said, what are you talking about? I said, you talked to a nail there about an hour ago. He said, man, no, what? I said, how come you're talking to the nail? He said, oh, I really didn't realize I said anything to a nail. I said, yeah, you talked to that nail back there an hour ago and told it he had to go into the wall this time. He stood there saying, he said, you know, bless God, I did, didn't I? Well, see, you can't live any other way. Solomon said, you're snared by the words of your mouth. And Jesus said, you're justified by the words of your mouth. Spiritual law. I want you to see that it's governed by law. If Jesus said you'll have what you say, if you believe in your heart and not doubt but, and speak and believe that those things which you say are come to pass, you're going to have what you say. Well, why does it work so proficiently over in the negative realm? Because you've spent all your time listening to this negative, lousy, sinful world and you've governed everything on each level. We're not demanding to govern everything on this level. We can reach out beyond that light border and reach unto life himself and control what's in this realm through the word and the power of God by the authority of the name of Jesus, which has authority in all three worlds. And every tongue shall confess and every knee bow that he is Lord of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth.
that's the Lord God forever. Satan's limited to this realm. And we're unlimited. Glory to God. We're not even citizens of this realm. We've been reborn. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But if you're going to walk in that other world, you're going to have to walk by the laws of the other world. And our Christian people get messed up and fouled up and everything else trying to walk in both. You see businessmen trying to be spiritual three days a week <laughs> and natural four. And it's going to foul you up. You're trying to use God's principles and you're trying to use the world's principles and I'll tell you what, you're not going to get much out of God and the world's going to beat you at their own game. And you're always standing out there saying, Why do you let this happen to me? What do I do? Nothing. That's what's the matter. You didn't do anything that you should have done. You walk in the light of these things. It's all governed by law. The problem's been not knowing the laws. This same person tells you they don't believe in this saying stuff will walk up to the washing machine and kick it. You sorry piece of trash. <laughs> With Sears and Robot had you back. <laughs> but just let Sears and Robot come out there to repossess it and you can hide it. <laughs> and what do you want? You want them to have it back on you? <laughs> You're too faced about everything you do. Praise the Lord. All right. Notice how sin is defeated. Eighth verse. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When? When you confess them. That's when you put the thing into motion. You took the word that is the picture of that sin and spit it out your mouth when you confessed it. That's not when God found out about it. He knew it all the time. Didn't do you any good to tell him about it as far as informing God. Did you notice God asked Adam when he moved in on him in the garden of Eden, he asked him what he was doing, what he had been doing. God put some questions before him. God was trying to get the man to confess it right then, and the fellow had sense enough to do it. He tried to throw it all off on his wife. But the first sin he confessed was fear. Confessed it right out of his mouth. Are you listening to me? All right, let's go on. Sin is death. I want to say this to you about something. Let's clear up something in your thinking. It does not always take someone to kill someone else. It is really very rare that Satan literally killed somebody. He doesn't have to. In fact, he doesn't have the power to just move in on you and just kill you just because he wants to. If he did that, he'd already kill us all. Because that's his goal in life is to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a thief and the father of all liars. Now there are times when he'll set out to kill somebody and, uh, and prearrange things as well as he can to get that person to walk in it and walk themselves into a death trap. I've seen it happen. You've seen it happen. I've seen it more over in the area of witchcraft and rebellion. You take somebody that's been involved deeply in witchcraft and they receive Jesus as Lord and begin to walk in the things of God, he'll set traps for them. He'll try to kill them faster than anybody else. But if they'll walk in the word and the power of God, you can't do it. And I want you to listen to this. I, I want to teach you something here. You need to see this. Sin will kill you. Sin will kill you on its own. Sin is death. The wages of sin is death. When you sin, you remove life. When you sin, it causes a start. And all of the power that has been feeding your body to live is now shouted out. And your faith gets feeble. Your joy is drained out. That's the reason God hates sin. It's not because he didn't want you to have a good time. It's because it'll kill you. And in him is no death. And in the 
remain and cause his death, he's against it because if he was for it, it would get in him. And he'd have to bow down to Satan. And it ain't going to happen. You can forget that. He's not going to bow down to him. I'm not going to bow down to him. Now, you can do what you want to do about it. But I made up my mind, me and my household are going to live. Praise the Lord. Now, sin will kill. Look what happened during the flood. God didn't cause the flood that Noah was involved in. Sin caused it. That flood is not the will of God. Was it? No, it wasn't the will of God. Had it been for sin, that flood never would have happened. Sin. See, nobody was resisting the sin that was in the earth. Nobody was. There wasn't but one man that was even attempting to serve God, and he didn't have anything like the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, or very little of the Word of God to rebuke that sin with. He just stayed before God and walked in what light he had. But the force and the power of sin eventually erupted. Some people have the, the, the feeble idea that that uh, rain for 40 days and 40 nights was an ex exceptional strong thunderstorm that God kind of sent over that way. You couldn't wring that much water out of 40 days of rain. No, the Bible said the fountains of the deep broke up. Sin broke it up. It was breaking the prison apart. God had to step in on that thing to even save the human race. Sin was killing everybody. I've seen sin kill people. You have too. Some fellow sinks a slab in his arm, overdoses on it. The devil didn't kill that fellow. He killed himself. Sin killed him. Satan had very little to do with it. Oh, any time you start to go away from it, Satan would just turn up the fire about you to him, keep him hooked. But the Bible said that if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. The Bible said that all of these forces, spiritual forces that are inside the reborn human spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, faith, meekness, temperance, what does the Bible say about those forces? Against those there is no law. That's the highest law there is. Those are the highest forces there is. And when you bring those forces to bear, when you find out how they work, when you put them into motion, when you put that thing into operation, there's not any other operation that can stop it. It can't stand up in front of it. None of the fruit of the flesh can stand up against the fruit of the Spirit. The spiritual forces are always more powerful than natural forces. Why? Because this natural planet is limited. But when you reach out beyond that, you reach into the unlimited in realm of God, His Word, His power, His blood, hallelujah, and He is in us. Where is the kingdom of heaven anyway? Oh, somebody said, our prayers didn't give you any higher than the seated brother Pope. Mine didn't either. They ain't give any higher than the lows. He is in there. Your prayer didn't need to get any higher in the ceiling. What are you holding up banging it on the ceiling for? He's in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. The gift of God is life. 1 John 2. We're already there. Let's look at the 25th verse. This is the promise. He has promised us even. Notice the word even. Notice what a super word that is in, in the context of this scripture. Even. That means that God didn't leave out anything, brother. I mean, even eternal life. Even Zoe. Even this non-compromising, overcoming, absolute life. The gift of God is life. Now let's get into some scriptures about this. Let's go over to the Gospel of John chapter 4. And you don't find this all over your Bible. I don't have time to give you all the scriptures on it because this is what the New Testament's written about. Fourth 
fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, look at the tenth verse. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and, take your pencil and underline the word and, it's a conjunction, so we're talking about two different things. We're talking about the gift of God and something else. If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that giveth to, that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Water that is alive. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into joy, springing up into everlasting life, springing up into him absolute life. Now that life force, then, is what we're talking about here. Now, John 10.10 10 ought to tell you something. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I'm come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly than what? More abundantly than anything. It's absolute life. It's more abundant than anything. It's more abundant than death. It's more powerful than death. Another scripture. We found out that the gift of God is life. Well, the gift of God is Jesus. Jesus, in Acts 3.15, is called the Prince of Life. He is the Prince of Life. He's the greatest thing that Zoe has ever brought into existence. Zoe brought him here. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But then he let life loose. He made himself obedient to death. It's the reason he didn't say anything at Calvary. If he'd said anything, it would have delivered him. So he kept his mouth shut. He did not sin by receiving sin with his mouth. He just said it. That's what a lot of us need to learn how to do, isn't it? <laughs> Keep our big, bad mouth shut. Somebody comes up to him and says, How are you feeling? Well, that's none of your business anyway. I may be in the process of changing it. <laughs> so if I'm not feeling well, and my word level is low, what I need to do is learn the vocabulary of silence. Just don't say anything. Just look at you. <laughs> Not being very many people do that. And when you do look at somebody, I can just look at them and think, <laughs> you suppose his bread not done? I mean, why doesn't he answer me? <laughs> it's none of your business. In the first place, I don't want you agreeing with me that I'm sick. And most of you do it. I mean, somebody gets up in the morning and has some little old pain. First thing you want to do is go in the kitchen and tell everybody in the family about it. I don't know how bad I feel today. And you look around and say, mm -hmm, you lick it too. <laughs> you just look like you couldn't put one foot in front of the other. We had a kid in high school. You know, children that don't know Jesus are mean. Some of them that do know Jesus are ugly. <laughs> well, they don't know the word. <laughs> we found out this guy would believe anything we'd tell him. So we'd start in on him in the morning. <laughs> we made this deal up one day, and then about four or five of us. When we had assignments during the day, I went to a large high school. High school, I went and had over 2,000 students in it. And, and we'd, we'd meet this guy in the hall, you know, going and coming. One of us started off in the morning and said, Man, what happened to your eye? Well, I know that. Oh, boy, I don't look good at all. So 
And we told him that all day. Different guys had different things that we'd meet up, we was going to say it to him during the day and find out what he would say to the last one that he talked to that day and compare that to what he said to the first one to see what he'd do. And so we kept saying that to him all day. Well, open your eye, man. There's another guy walk up to him a little bit, you know, say, Boy, your eye don't look good. What did you do? Oh, my. Oh, yeah, man. Look up. You ought to go down to the, you ought to go to the dispensary, man. Your eye don't look good at all. And you know, by the end of the day, he had in the story. <laughs> the last guy had to end it at the end of the day. He told him what happened to his eye. doing this mess you ever heard in your life. Look. Oh. During the day, though, he conjured that thing up in his mind. The last one said, where'd your eye? Boy, he told him the whole story about how he hurt it and how bad it hurt. Man, he said, I thought I was going to have to go home for the day, so. <laughs> he said, it took me a while to figure out what I'd done to it. Boy, I'm telling you, he said this thing started on me this morning and it's just gotten worse all day long. Boy, I mean... Boy, that's a shame you could affect somebody like that, but you can't. No, 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 everybody said easily affected, but you'd be surprised how you've been falling for that and didn't even know it. Satan's been doing it to you all the time. You get up some morning and say, Oh... And he starts in on you. Would you believe heart seizure? No, I haven't had heart seizure. Would you believe the bubonic plague? No, okay. Ain't nothing. Now you want to have her with you. And he just starts in on you and finally gets down to one you'll take. How about heart trouble? You reckon that's what it is? <laughs> it might be. I believe I got heart trouble. <laughs> You're right, now you do. You believe it, you said it. When you came in here, your wife said, Well, I guess you better go call the doctor. I believe you got, you know, I've been telling you every day of the world you're going to have to take it easy. I knew you was going to get it. What do you mean the world will pray about it? Well, I don't do any good. You know better than that. You can't go with that all the time. You better get you an appointment with the doctor. After all, he's busy. If you didn't get your healing this time, well, you know how it'd be. He'd get there, you'd be without a doctor, and you'd have to fall dead in the bathroom. Yeah, I'm liable to fall dead in the bathroom. I maybe I ought not bathe anymore.
anh ngày mơ mộng mình thứ xa xôi không bàn về tình ái một nơi sống cho lựa chọn kiếp đây thôi đâu có tâm gì chuyện đời thế mà lại nằm tương tư ông tầm bà mới xa tơ đêm nằm chỗ nhớ mơ mơ về ai thì xa anh yêu rồi từ anh mất nụ cười từ đôi môi gọi người xa xuống lòng anh thì xa mê Time's just like a test If only I could go back in time I'd tell myself that everything will end up alright Just push yourself, test yourself, figure out what you like And find your limits, don't be rigid, always work towards a prime Surround yourself with open minds, people can change your life A few friends with intent can help you feel alive Find a passion, take some action, and with a little time Just be patient, make a statement, try to enjoy your life They'll try to kick you while you're down They wanna rise up while you drown They wanna fill your head with doubt They're silently scared that you'll figure it out I'll make it look like I'm losing Won't bother hiding my bruises And when they finally think you're wounded Then it's your chance to be ruthless Be ruthless. 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 Be
me care Anytime I make some progress I can see that they compare I think everyone's against me Maybe something in the air Am I paranoid? I swear a void is forming And they're scared I walk a straight